everyone uh, to the Jacksonville Urban League Center for Advocacy and Social Justice Town Hall featuring uh, a team of experts on the COVID vaccine. We're holding this in um, partnership with the Northeast Florida Medical Society and the Population Health Consortium of Northeast Florida. We're very grateful for the efforts of these two groups to reach out to the community served by the Urban League and their efforts to deal with the impact of COVID-19. This is part of a series sponsored by the center as part of our community engagement process. Previous town halls have addressed racial equity issues, including access to dental health, education, reentry programs for the formerly incarcerated, voter, excuse me, suppression and criminal justice reform. Tomorrow night, we will be hosting representatives from the Jaguars organization discussing their Lot J plans and the impact on the economy. I really want to thank the uh, speakers who will be uh, introduced by our moderator, Jocelyn Turner, a former public health de uh, department professional. Uh, Jocelyn and the Urban League uh, staff and volunteers, I'm so grateful for the work that they've done and, and we couldn't make this possible without them. And special thanks to our interns from Florida Coastal School of Law and Florida State University who are working with us tonight. Uh, to make this uh, a smooth and uh, very effective presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to our uh, president, uh, Dr. Richard Danford, to say a few words before we, we begin. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, good evening to uh, viewers and uh, participants uh, to this evening's uh, virtual community town hall uh, on COVID-19 uh, vaccine. And as I as I pivot around and, and I see on, on the television, the, the main news today is certainly the vaccine and, and certainly um, uh, getting it out to the people that we should uh, get it out to. Uh, we, I'm so pleased that tonight we will uh, discuss the implications uh, of the vaccine uh, uh, as it relates to diverse populations. Uh, and of course, we're in Jacksonville, Florida, so certainly we are concerned about uh, Northeast Florida. So again, I wanna thank all of you participating. I wanna thank our experts for being here with us. And I want to thank all of you for your support as we continue to, uh, our, in terms of our mission, uh, getting our community involved in, in activities and services that impact their lives. So that's what it's about. And we will continue uh, providing these types of uh, venues for our community. So again, thank you, Dennis, uh, for your work uh, here at the Urban League and Jocelyn, <clears throat> uh, one of our uh, young guild members that's been around for many, many years uh, and now providing a lot of service here at the Jacksonville Urban League. So thank all of you. And I look forward to the discussion. And I'll just take a minute to introduce uh, Jocelyn. She um, uh, returned to her hometown in Jacksonville, Florida after graduating from the University of Florida. Uh, and she began her career in public health and worked for 36 years for the Florida Department of Health in Duval County. Her experience has been varied, including health education, community relations, communications, event and conference planning, and much more. She was instrumental in uh, forming the Healthy Jacksonville Men's Health Coalition and the Hispanic Health Council of Jacksonville. Her work with these groups includes the annual health summit for men and boys and the publication of a Hispanic Health Report and Hispanic Resource Guide for Families New to Jacksonville and Unaware of Where to Access Local Health and Social Services. Jocelyn is a seasoned health professional with a passion for facilitating focus groups and town hall discussions with large and small groups assessing their health concerns. Throughout her career, she has been a guest presenter at conferences, on local and radio television shows, educating 
about health. Her work has expanded to include community engagement, health equity, and social justice. She graduated from Leadership Jacksonville class of 1999, served in leadership roles on numerous boards and held members, memberships in various uh, professional organizations. Two of her proudest uh, accomplishments is, uh, were serving as president of the Florida Association of Professional Health Educators and in her current role as founding president of the University of Florida Association of Black Alumni Jacksonville Chapter, where she looks forward to growing the membership and raising funds for scholarships. Since retirement, she devotes her time to her travel business and spending quality time with her family and friends. And I know personally, she has been spending a lot of time uh, working with the coalition and the Urban League in our health and our efforts really to expand uh, our focus on health advocacy. So with that, I'll turn it to, over to you, Jocelyn. Uh, we know we're in good hands. Good evening and thank you, Dennis, for the introduction and good evening everyone for joining us tonight. It's an exciting evening. It's an exciting time in our country and the world actually as the vaccine has been introduced. And we are pleased to have local experts who are not just experts locally, but all across the country. And I was equal, really proud the other day as I've shared with him that the first vaccine that was given in Jacksonville was done not only by my alma mater, University of UF Health, Dr. Leon Haley, um, showing his leadership and the importance of the vaccine. So we are super excited for a great evening and look forward to a robust discussion and welcome you to ask questions throughout this evening's presentation. We're gonna start now and I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Barry Wright. Dr. Wright is the president of the Northeast Florida Medical Society, the co-host of this evening's event. Dr. Wright is a physician at Baptist Medical Center. He's actually a hospitalist with Baptist. He has, his education includes a global theological university, associate degree candidate, University of South Carolina Medical School, where he received his medical degree, South Carolina State University in Orangeburg, South Carolina, Bachelor of Science in Biology. Dr. Wright. Uh, good evening. Good evening. And, uh, you know, thank you everyone for uh, attending our mirror, everyone else's uh, sentiment. Uh, you know, we appreciate your presence, uh, you know, even the experts that will uh, continue to educate us. And, uh, you know, I'll say out of all the, uh, you know, accolades, the biggest thing is a heart for uh, the community and seeing what's best for, um, you know, everyone there. Um, so, you know, the Northeast Florida Medical Society, we're actually a group, uh, probably about a 60 African-American uh, physicians or so and allied health professionals um, established a few decades ago, initially, uh, you know, attempting uh, to push back some of the disparities that we see prevalent in medicine, whether in medical institutions, uh, in the community, um, you know, I'll say many of the things we've seen at that time, uh, you know, the COVID uh, pandemic that we've seen has only highlighted that. Um, one of the challenges is that we've seen a mistrust in the community, perhaps due to uh, stuff such as a Tuskegee experiment, uh, or even, uh, you know, gynecological experiences with uh, uh, Dr. Sims. So our goal, um, you know, with this is to kind of bridge the gap between the, com uh, the medical community and also our, uh, you know, uh, the people that we serve in order to um, uh, mitigate any fears, any anxieties, make sure everybody's thoroughly uh, educated. Um, you know, as King said, of all forms of inequality, uh, health care um, is probably one of the most uh, egregious injustices. And, um, you know, we have a lot of tools to be able to avoid repeating the mistakes that we've seen in the past. Uh, you know, we have media, we have Zoom, we're able to collaborate on a much more uh, intricate uh, uh, scale. So I look forward to a progressive uh, discussion with you guys. Thank you, Dr. Wright. We appreciate it. And we also appreciate the Northeast Florida Medical Society for partnering with the Jacksonville Urban League on this event and for all your leadership roles in the community. I know you didn't mention it, but I'll go ahead and give you accolades and thank the organization through the foundation for presenting scholarships to local students to further their education, hopefully in medicine, to expand the number of students from Jacksonville that join the medical profession. So thanks again. I appreciate it. 
And so now I'd like to introduce to some, and again, he became a celebrity the other day by becoming the first person in Jacksonville to receive the vaccine. Dr. Leon Haley Jr. Is, cur is currently serves as the CEO of View of Health Jacksonville, Vice President for Health Affairs and Dean of the University of Florida College of Medicine, Jacksonville, and Professor of Emergency Medicine. He previous previously served as the Emory Executive Associate Dean for Clinical Services at Grady and Chief Medical Officer of the Emory Medical Care Foundation. A former professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Emory, Dr. Haley formerly served as Deputy Senior Vice President of Medical Affairs, Chief of Emergency Medicine for the Grady Health System, and Vice Chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Emory University. A native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, one of my favorite cities, Dr. Haley, he received his undergraduate degree from Brown University, his medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh, and his master's degree in health services administration from the University of Michigan. Dr. Haley completed his residency, including a year as chief resident in emergency medicine at Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Michigan. Good evening, Dr. Haley. Good evening. I hope everyone is doing well and thank you for the opportunity um, to speak this evening. So I want to just very quickly run through a series of slides and end up with sort of a very quick um, thought on the vaccine. And then I'll lead into some questions. So this is an opportunity for us to level set and a reminder of the implications of COVID and, um, and it is still here and we are still managing through it. So a little bit about background, transmission, current data, implications for African-Americans and potentially some treatment options that include not only the vaccine, but also the things we do. So COVID is a single-stranded RNA virus. Uh, the picture on the left is kind of what we come to know of it, but that's what it actually really looks like to the right. And it is representative of a number of viruses that are very common to us, including things like SARS and even just the regular common cold. So COVID um, and uh, coronaviruses in general have been around for a very long time. We've been studying them for a very long time, which actually led to some of the rapidity that we were able to create as it relates to the virus. But it is impactful and is certainly making a big difference. Uh, origins in Wuhan, China, and we think we've heard that story many, many times, and there's lots of different thoughts and processes around sort of how it got there, and I'll just show you a quick slide. Um, but this is Dr. Li Wenlang. He is a uh, physician in, in, in Wuhan, China, and he actually was the one who sort of signaled some early warnings about the potential risk of COVID-19 and its impact on the global world, and unfortunately, his emails were censored. He unfortunately later died of coronavirus, and it just tells you that even as we Frequently as a year ago, we were already seeing the, the, the throes of COVID. We believe it's a virus that moves from animals to humans, and the theory currently is that it started as a, a through bats and then through an intermediate host. The pangolin is a uh, popular pet in China, and then infected um, humans. And that's been seen before. And there's obviously some concerns around sanitation and quality control in China, but it's not the first time that we've seen viruses that have jumped from an animal host to humans. And we saw that back in 2002 with SARS or severe acute respiratory syndrome or which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. So it has happened before. And unfortunately, um, given some of the globalness of our world and our economy, we have the risk for it happening again. COVID is certainly significant, um, but there have been other significant pandemics in our history going back. And you've probably heard it uh, more than you would have ever imagined back in 1918. Um, we had the Spanish flu, which killed over 50 million people. So unfortunately, uh, the, the trend of having viruses with significant impact on humans, human behavior is not new and, and probably will continue. So it's important for us to continue to follow the same steps necessary to try to rid ourselves of the virus. Um, we know that it is spread through droplets, um, through coughs and sneezes and exhales. And that's important um, because as we get through the vaccine and why it's important, it is important to remember that these things are still absolutely gonna be critical um, as we move forward. And this is why washing your hands is important because obviously people can cough on their hands and spread that to us. But where are we today? So this is data just even from early this morning. So across the globe, 73.7 uh, million cases of COVID, almost 1.6 million deaths. 
in the United States, 16.7 million cases of COVID, 300,000 deaths, um, unfortunately. And this is the equivalent of having a little bit more than a 9-11 event every day that's occurring. In the state of Florida, we've now unfortunately joined the state of Texas as one of a few that have crossed over to now having 1.24 million cases and unfortunately 20,000 folks that have died. And what we're now seeing is a resurgence of hospitalizations as it relates to COVID. And so this goes back to when we really started uh, first calculating sort of the number of hospitalizations and um, as they relate to COVID. And we thought, and if you go through the sort of right before the peak, we thought we had sort of escaped. Um, and this kind of takes us through about mid-June. And then you see this rapid spike and rise over the course of the summer. I mean, no, in our institution, our biggest peak was in the middle of July with over 100. 13 hospitalized patients um, with COVID. And then we were able to get things a little bit under control, but you notice never actually going quite back to zero. And now we're starting to see the COVID numbers rise back again. And that is trend line that we're seeing not only here in Florida, but also certainly in Duval County, which has 50,000 cases and over 685 deaths. But again, also seeing a rise in the hospitalizations um, as it relates to our particular county. I looked at the county numbers, county city numbers today, and over 321 people are currently hospitalized in the city of Jacksonville with COVID. Uh, I can take you back uh, to even just uh, a few weeks ago was 121, and we haven't been over 300 total hospitalized patients um, in, this, in the city of Jacksonville since August. Um, and so we can see that this is what we're, um, we're going through as, a, as institutions across the city. Um, and it's not uh, being, and it is being shared by all of our uh, different hospitals. And fortunately, we've had a great relationship with the individual hospital leaders across the city um, to make sure that we can try and address it as much as possible. COVID, as you've probably heard, has very significant impacts in underrepresented minority communities. And this just gives you just a quick synopsis of, you know, cases versus hospitalizations versus deaths um, as compared to white, non-Hispanics. Um, and you can see in basically almost every group, um, except for some of the Asian non-Hispanics, there's a higher risk of the number of cases, number of hospitalizations and deaths. And this is functions of a number of different things, including access to care, um, being frontline workers um, and many different specialties and also having comorbidities. And so those are things that make this a very significant disease in our representative community. These are some of the significant risk factors as it relates to COVID. And early on, I think many of us thought of COVID as a respiratory disease, people having to be on ventilators. And, um, and as we've seen, the bigger risk factors are related to things that are very common in the underrepresented minority and African-American community, including hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, CD is the other one that's not on there. And so those are all fairly significant and they create very significant risk factors for patients. There's some new literature about as we've begun to study COVID and looking at the, uh, the deaths that have occurred that um, some of our team members have started to look at. And that's not only just the actual deaths, but the impact of the average years of lives lost. And so we're starting to see data of how significant COVID is creating for um, years of life loss. And in terms of patients who, as you can see, are 45 to 64, and that's kind of the biggest group. And unfortunately, they're dying before they turn 75, which is the current overall estimated life expectancy. This is more significant than almost every other respiratory disease, including influenza um, and chronic lower respiratory diseases. And we can see, unfortunately, like we saw in the earlier data, it's affecting the African American, Indian Native American populations much more significantly um, than it is in others. And so we are starting to see this impact, not only just deaths, but also the years lost of life as, you know, we now creep over 300,000 deaths. Unfortunately, there is no cure for COVID at this point in time. Um, the one great thing that has occurred during COVID um, from a research and scientific perspective, and I know my colleague, um, Mobin Rathor is on the phone, he'll probably address this, is this is one of the few times, if not the only times in the collective throes of medicine and science, we've had almost every scientist uh, focusing on a single disease, which is why we've been able to rapidly create a vaccine, but we're still not at the point yet where we have a cure. And so because of that, 
we still have to work on things to continue to flatten the curve and get those hospitalizations down. And this is why until we can really get the vaccine completely rolled out through our community, wearing a mask, hand washing and social distancing become critically important. So wear your mask, even after you get the vaccine, make sure you continue to do your social distancing as it relates, especially to everything you do, staying away from indoor um, gatherings if possible, stay outside and making sure that you're continuing to wash your hands because that is really the most effective treatment um, at this point. And if you don't have access to hand washing, then hand sanitizers with at least 60% alcohol absolutely are critically important. And for those of us in the healthcare community, PPE and personal protective equipment um, also is absolutely critical. There's a number of, as I said earlier, there's a number of research looking at current limits of treatment. Um, and so the good news is we've started to narrow in on a few things that we know that are highly successful, including steroids and monoclonal antibodies. But just know from a hospital scientific community, there are a number of trials that are continuing to be underway as we continue to roll out the vaccine. And just know that the collective resources of the healthcare community and scientific community are really putting their weight behind trying to develop a vaccine. So here we are today. We now have two vaccines uh, that have been approved by the FDA. One that is currently out, that is the one at the top, that's the Pfizer vaccine, um, has just finished its uh, phase three trials and tested over 35,000 people um, through its course of its trials. And the Moderna vaccine on the bottom has tested almost 40,000 and a number of others that are obviously in play. Um, we've begun to roll out the uh, Pfizer vaccine um, throughout the case of, through the, um, excuse me, through the state of Florida. Um, 100,000 um, doses that have been administered to the hospitals. The state took the methodology of choosing five institutions to, anch to, act, to act as anchor institutions in certain locations throughout the state, including Jacksonville, Orlando, Tampa, and two in South Florida, both at Broward, I'm sorry, both at um, uh, Memorial Health and Jackson Memorial. We've been instructed with those 20,000 doses to basically vaccinate as many people as possible at our institutions and then share with our surrounding institutions. So while we've been rolling it out slowly, and today was our big day with over 700 people that were vaccinated, um, we will begin sharing and starting tomorrow at St. Vincent's and Mayo and HCA, those hospitals will start their vaccinations and Baptist will begin um, on Friday. There was also an announcement that just came out earlier this uh, afternoon that we are expecting the Moderna vaccine, which has now been approved to start coming to 173 other hospitals in the state. Uh, one of the big differences, the Pfizer vaccine requires ultra cold storage to the temperature of minus 94. And while Moderna requires to be kept uh, frozen and cold, not at the same level. And so it'll make it a little bit easier um, to distribute to the other hospitals in the state. So hopefully by next week, many of the other hospitals in the the state will begin to vaccinate their folks. Just a real quick statement on the vaccine technology, and I know everybody's concerned about the speed and rapid and how fast things were evaluated, but all we really did was put a lot of money um, behind it. We put a lot of collective effort um, into this, and really what we are doing is creating a vaccine that is not a live virus, but is a messenger and RNA virus that's injected into you, enters the cell, creates a um, protein activation, and then creates an immune response. Basically, it's tricking your body into acting and responding to COVID-19. Um, we know from the early trials that it is successful. You're feeding the 95% on Pfizer. The Moderna vaccine is 94%. Um, and that's one of the reasons why those are the two that are going to be implemented as quickly as possible um, moving forward. But it is not a live virus. You will not catch COVID from the vaccine. Um, and hopefully what does create the appropriate immune response. Now, what we don't know in all fairness is how long it will work um, and whether or not we'll have to take another vaccine in the, in the fall. Will it be like what we see with the flu where we have to take a, a vaccine every phone. And those are things that we're still exploring, but we do know that there is success. And we saw that actually when you look at uh, COVID-19, when we look at the trials of the messenger RNA versus the patients who were given placebo. And as quickly as day 12, you begin to see this huge separation of the patients who receive the vaccine versus those who don't. And, and, um, and in both trials, none of the patients who received the vaccine um, got COVID. Um, the other thing we don't completely know is whether or not if you even if you've gotten the vaccine whether or not you're still capable of carrying it and spreading it to people and so until we can explore through that that's where the masking distancing and washing your hands become critically important 
But as was said, we rolled out the vaccine earlier this week, um, and I happened to be one of the first people to receive that vaccine. Um, and I did that for a number of different reasons. One, to show leadership. We have, I will tell you, about 60% of our staff are still concerned about taking the vaccine. And so I thought it was important to show them that I'm comfortable with the science, comfortable um, with uh, where we are from a vaccine perspective and how we need to get it out, how it needs to be part of our mission to do that. And certainly as an African-American, wanted to um, say to the African-American community, I, I understand the concern. Um, it was just mentioned a few minutes ago, and I really appreciate everybody's thought process on it, but I'm comfortable with where we are, where the science is, and why it's important um, for us as a leadership team, as an organization for the Urban League and its partners to really help make sure that we're getting people vaccinated. We would anticipate that we can roll out um, vaccinations of the rest of our staff, um, probably some, some additional first responders during the month of, uh, of uh, December, and they begin to work on a community-wide approach, hopefully um, as early as sort of middle January. Um, don't have any details on that. We're certainly closely working with the state. I know the state is working with Walgreens and CVS on some delivery options as well, but hopefully we can start to get to the community in late January and February. Don't quote me on that, um, but it is an opportunity for us to think that, uh, that as a reasonable target. So I'll stop there and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Hi, my name is Beth. Thank you, Dr. Haley. So right now, I would like to introduce Dr. Rogers Kane. Dr. Kane will ask Dr. Haley some questions. Dr. Kane is a family practice physician. He's been in practice, private practice for over 30 years. His, he's currently at Lim Turner Family Medical Care, trained at UF Health. He was actually the chief resident at UF Health Jacksonville in 1998. He is a graduate of FAMU College of School of Pharmacy and Morehouse. Wait a minute, did I say that right? Graduate of FAMU School of Pharmacy and Morehouse School of Medicine. He is the president of the Northeast Florida Medical Society Foundation, president emeritus of the Northeast Florida Medical Society, and a proud graduate, so he told, tells me, of Leadership Jacksonville Class of 1995 and Leadership Florida class of 1996. Dr. Kane, go ahead and with follow-up questions of Dr. Haley. All right, thank you, Ms. Turner. One correction, I was actually chief resident in 1988, so add another 10 years to that the <laughs> age process. <laughs> Dr. Haley, thank you for such an efficient and comprehensive presentation uh, 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 as it relates to the uh, COVID-19 virus and what our, uh, the, the directions that we're trying to go uh, uh, through in, in this country. I would, um, you did such an excellent job that some of the questions that I have were kind of moot at this point, but I will ask you a couple. Um, I think earlier today, it was kind of reported that we expected about 450,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine. However, the governor uh, reported that we have some production issues uh, and it may not be delivered in this, previously scheduled time slot. How do you think this is gonna affect us in this area? Um, we hope it won't. Um, I saw that same communication. I know Pfizer is trying to work with the federal government on distribution. Also, a lot of it is around the raw materials necessary to create the transport medium, things like that. Um, we have, from what I didn't say, is the Pfizer vaccine requires a second dose at day um, 21. Um, if you go back and look at the literature, it would suggest that the first dose does a reasonable job, gets you up to about 50 to 60%, um, and you start to see that at around day 10. Um, that being said, it does need to booster at uh, day 21. Now, there's a little bit of leeway. Um, some patients were given it at 18, some were given it at day 22. Um, so as long as it comes before the first set of day 21 for us, which will be the early January, I think will be reasonably successful. The Moderna vaccine um, is 28 days, and so that one will start rolling out next week. We hope um, and then they'll have a month. So yes, we're, well, you know, we obviously watch that. We will have some concern, but I anticipate that we'll still reach um, the goal necessary to get people that second dose by early January. Cool. Not to put you on the spot, but I am. Uh, the, the, um, will the COVID-19 vaccine be mandated for UF health employees? We have not mandated it. 
um, and uh, none of our sister hospitals have. And quite frankly, we've had a lot of conversation about this um, at this point in time. So I would say not now. Um, we have, like I said, very concerned, you know, faculty and staff. Um, when we did our survey two weeks ago, we still had about 40% of our staff who were unsure or not wanting to take it. So we don't want to mandate it. Um, we do want to encourage it. And so we do forums like this. We've done forums with our staff. Um, uh, Dr. Rathorn has talked to our teams. He's part of some of the research that's going on. And so we want to continue to encourage people. Now that's now. Now if, you know, depending on what COVID looks like over the summer, um, and whether or not we need a repeat vaccine, I think we may have to have a different conversation. Um, but for the moment, we're not mandating it. But, but at least we're being transparent. Yes, uh, absolutely. As, as a hospital CEO, are there any areas of a need that haven't been met with the federal state uh, support uh, as it relates to the COVID-19 vaccine uh, and its distribution? You know, I, uh, you're safe in that institution as, you know, and, and took leadership in terms of distribution to other hospitals in the area. I am also concerned about uh, the uninsured, underinsured, uh, the homeless and, and the indigent. And uh, I know in the past being, you know, having had work at UF Health and uh, I know we've taken, meaning UF Health, uh, at that time it was Universal Hospital, she hands on it. Um, but I know we've taken the brunt of having to take care of those patients that are, are uninsured, uninsured, indigent, and so on and so on. Anything that, if you had a wish list to tell the state what you would like, or federal, you know, or the feds, what you would like to have done so that you can impact this area to a greater degree than what, uh, that what you have so far, any uh, comment on that? You know, I think the biggest thing I, I would comment, so we've been, um, very successful with the state. I'm glad that the state had enough faith in us to choose us as one of the local centers um, to recognize our role as an academic safety net. Um, that's important. Um, what I would ask the state is to keep giving us vaccine, quite frankly, and keep giving us the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine. Um, as you know, early on, we went into the community to do testing, um, took that at the, really went into the neighborhoods, did that at a couple different clinics. And we'll, we wanna be able to do a version of that too. And so when we're authorized or we have enough vaccine, you know, our goal was to get people vaccinated, right? And as many people as possible. And if that means we have to go back into the community on foot, we'll do that. If that means we have to work with with um, some of our community partners like Salzbacher on the homeless and those who are struggling with shelter, um, we'll work with them. So, you know, we want as many, you saw those figures I put up on the African-American uh, underrepresented minority community. We have got to get them the vaccine. So I would just ask for the state for as much vaccine as they can give us so we can impact the community, so we can work with the other um, community partners, work with the Urban League and really get it out there. Um, but so far I can say, you know, right now, um, we've, we've been working with the state very closely I, in fact, right now they're on a call. I, I'm missing it right now, but we have a call every day with the state on distribution issues, those kinds of things. We've got a call with the FHA tomorrow, Florida Hospital Association. So, you know, I would say, you know, one one side like to COVID is we've had great partnership with the hospital community here locally, the other hospital CEOs and across the state. Um, I, it's probably not more than two days I go without talking to at least one other hospital CEO about COVID. So, Keep doing what you're doing. Keep you know the, the pressure on the state to make sure that we're getting vaccines so we can get it to the community. One last question: I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Uh, as a primary care provider and out there on the front line, uh, granted I'm not in the emergency room and having to, to see as many uh, COVID patients in the in uh, when they're at that sickest moment. Uh, but being a primary care provider, as well as some of the colleagues I have in the uh, in the in the area. One of the things that we run into is that we're not protected, but but I can also become a vector. You know, my office can also become a vector. Any ideas, any insights into when they, we're going to start looking at the community physicians and vaccinations to help take care of their offices to prevent further spread, whether it's in my office or to my patients? That is a great question, and that is exactly what tomorrow's Florida Hospital Association call is, um, which is how can we go that next tier down, right? So we're going to focus on frontline healthcare workers at the hospital level, and then that call tomorrow is how can we support you? How can we support your colleagues? One of the things we're going to do, for example, is any one of our community hospital, community physicians that is associated with us one way or another, we're going to get to them. 
And then, but I want to get to you, you know, we still haven't quite frankly figured out how we're going to get to um, fire and rescue the police department. There's the, the jail system. So there's a number of, of groups that we've got to figure out how to get to. We haven't had got that direction from the state, which goes back to your other question. We need as much vaccine as possible so we can really help you the state, um, the prison system, we just have lots of people. To, and so we're gonna be doing this for a long time, but that's part of our role. That's part of our mission as an organization. Just as an FYI, in the last uh, 40, uh, 24 hours, uh, maybe 48, I've had eight patients that tested positive for COVID just yeah. in my practice alone. Oh yeah. And I'm sure yeah. that, I mean, it's a drop in the bucket, but at the same time, I don't have a big practice. And I know, you know, you guys have a whole, a lot of primary care guys out there. And so it becomes critical that if we don't want to become a become offices of super of super spreaders and vectors, that we we must get that vaccine as well. Absolutely. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. I appreciate it. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, Dr. Haley and Dr. Kane. We appreciate it. That was very informative. And Dr. Haley, I know you're extremely busy, but we invite you to stay on as we open up the conversation to the community later to ask questions. So next we'll have Dr. Mobin Rathor. Dr. Rathor doesn't know it, but I've been a fan of his for a long time. He has been a very busy person the past few months as most of our medical profession has been. Dr. Rathor is passionate about equity, diversity, and inclusion, champion for the American Academy of Pediatrics, and chair elect of the board of One Jacks. He is professor and associate, associate chair, Department of Pediatrics, and founding director of the University of Florida Center for HIV AIDS Research, Education, and Service, UF CARES. He also serves as chair of infection prevention and control committee of Baptist Health System and hospital epidemiologist for Wolfson Children's Hospital. In addition, he is founder of Muslim American Social Services for Mass Clinic, which is a clinic for the uninsured. He has served as president of Duval Medical Society and Leadership Jacksonville. Welcome, Dr. Rathor. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Uh, can you share my, can you see my slides? We see you. Oh, okay, you see me. Well, I'm not as good looking as this guy, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to start my slides. Uh, can you see them now? Yes. Thank you, Jocelyn. Jocelyn, uh, Jocelyn and I go back long way. We remember we were dealing with the measles uh, outbreak and epidemic in the 90s and many, many other things and the HIV. So thank you, Jocelyn, for that uh, introduction. So um, Dr. Haley uh, actually set the stage very well for me. That's part of my lecture when I talked about for an hour for uh, vaccines. Uh, Jocelyn only gave me 13 minutes. So I'm going to try to uh, stick to those 13 minutes. Uh, and I think, I don't know how many of you know who this guy is. He's this good looking guy. It's the last case of smallpox in the world. We were able to eradicate smallpox because of vaccines. And this is the first person in the world to this, well, I shouldn't say the world because Russians were giving it, the first person uh, in, in the Western world at least or approved vaccine uh, in the UK who got the first dose of Pfizer vaccine. So I think she's as much a pioneer as this guy is. Uh, so there are many vaccines that are uh, uh, in the pipelines, uh, about 150 at last count. Uh, this list just tells you which of those vaccines are in uh, testing and trials and are much ahead. Uh, what you see in the uh, uh, green are the two vaccines that are going to be most, uh, they're going to be available very soon. One is already, already available, the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine. And the Moderna vaccine, the FDA we're back is meeting tomorrow, the advisory committee, they will vote on it. And then it'll ACIP, the advisory committee organization practices of the CDC will meet and vote and make a recommendation on that. And we expect that to happen perhaps over the weekend. And the vaccine should be able to be shipped uh, early uh, next week. The UF, uh, uh, the University of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine uh, is also uh, very close to getting approved, we'll probably get approved in the UK first if it's not already been approved. And the Johnson Johnson vaccine is, and Novavax vaccine is on trials. The Sanofi GSK vaccine is the one that we will be studying. We are a part of, uh, at the University of Florida, we are a part of the 
uh, and National Institute of Health COVID Vaccine Prevention Network. And so we are conducting those trials uh, under the auspices of that. And you see several other vaccines there. You see the uh, Sinopharma vaccine. That vaccine is probably going to be given to more people than Pfizer in the early stages of than Pfizer and the uh, Moderna vaccines. Uh, I, I don't know much about that vaccine because they are not very transparent. There's no data that we can review, but these vaccines have already been approved in several for use and, and, and those countries are bought around the world, uh, in the Middle East and Africa and other parts of the world. So Sputnik V is the vaccine that the Russians are using, but that's only being used in Russia right now, but they're also getting ready to sell it. The AstraZeneca vaccine, they have given approval for local pharmaceutical companies in South Africa and India and Brazil, some of the BRIC countries to manufacture those vaccines there. They, they have given all the information for them to do it, which is actually a great thing. Uh, Dr. Haley already showed you so the virus. This is the where we're interested in the spike protein. That's the that's the one that uh, really is what uh, the uh, we have developed the antibodies against us uh, against uh, to protect us. There are many proteins on this virus, but this one seems to be the one that is uh, critical for developing antibodies and for protection. So this cartoon is very helpful to me. Uh, this is what the vaccine design. There's, there are several vaccines that are out there being studied. And the vaccines that we do, do we have uh, closer to the United States are BioNTech, Pfizer, and the Moderna vaccine. And as Dr. Haley said, these are messenger RNA vaccine. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. The AstraZeneca and Janssen vaccine are the recombinant viral vector vaccines. The recombinant vaccine, the one we are already familiar with, are like the hepatitis B vaccine, except in this case, the uh, recombinant viral vector is put in an, ad an adenovirus vector from chimpanzees that does not cause infection in humans, and that's the delivery system. In the BioNTech uh, and Moderna vaccines, the, the delivery system is uh, a, a nanopeptide, or a, a, a nanoparticle, a lipid, which is basically cholesterol. That is what uh, they use to administer the vaccine. And then, of course, the Novavax and the, uh, the Novavax and Sanofi vaccines are the subunit type vaccines, and, and they're also made in lab. And you can see we don't have any live attenuated vaccine. We don't have any whole inactivated vaccine. The point of this slide is we do not, we all, all we are having in vaccines are proteins that have been built in the lab. So none of these can cause infection, coronavirus infection in humans. There's also virus-like particle vaccines that are under development. The virus-like particle vaccine that we are probably most familiar with is the HPV vaccine. Uh, the monoclonal antibodies that uh, Dr. Haley referred to, uh, we are actually participating in three trials, uh, uh, through the, well, two through the NIH and one through a pharmaceutical company uh, to study these monoclonal antibodies, not only for treatment, uh, but also for prevention and for household contacts. So that's, that's very exciting, but these are passive immunities. These are not really vaccines. So I like to use this uh, cartoon because I think it's very helpful. So first of all, the, the, can, can vaccines cause uh, coronavirus infection and that can cause the disease? The answer is an emphatic no, it cannot. And why do I, why I'm so sure about that? Well, <clears throat> if you have a, a wheel, uh, a handle and a chain, that doesn't make a bicycle. So if you have a messenger RNA, something that's around it and that goes into the, the, uh, the body, that can cause the infection. The vaccines are being test that are being tested right now are made of synth synthetically in the lab and the pieces are then copied and then it's not the whole virus, it's just small parts of it, bits of it, actually very small parts of it. And so that's why they can cause the infection. So I think this is very important for us all to remember and to let others know. So when you're talking about a vaccine, just this cartoon shows what can be pieces of a vaccine sandwich. And there are different types of vaccine. You can have a genetic, you have a genetic code and that's the recipe. That's what the vaccine is made of. And then you have the bread, which is the vector in coronavirus vaccine, we are talking about the lipid uh, particle. And then the antigen is the meat. That's what actually the vaccine uh, has to react to or the body has to react to, I should say. That's what the vaccine's job is, to present an antigen to the body, so the body is strict in thinking, oh gosh, I'm being attacked, and they send in their Marines, which are the white cells, and then this, some of them will make antibodies, or they will <coughs> develop memory. <coughs> and some of the vaccines have ad adjuvant in them. And adjuvant, you can think of as sort of a condiment that boosts the taste of the sandwich, 
and boosts the ability of the vaccine, a body to respond to the vaccine. The Sanofi GSK vaccine has the adjuvant. Now there are many other vaccines that have adjuvant. The ones we are probably most familiar with are the, the, and some of the influenza vaccines. So these adjuvants have been used for many years. That's nothing new. Now, I don't know how many of you recognize this, but this uh, good looking family and this young good looking man in the yellow shirt and no, no shoes, he's, they are part of the Turkish immigrant family who in 1970 migrated to uh, Germany and, the, and they made, this is the guy and his wife are responsible for this vaccine. So uh, in my message to embrace diversity, immigrants make a difference. I'm a first generation American myself and I'm very proud to say that we, we as immigrants make great contributions to our community. And this is uh, Ugar Sahin and his wife, Aslam uh, Tuftorsi. They are people of color. They are brown people like me. And they are the ones who got the first vaccine, uh, coronavirus vaccine in the world. They are both Muslims from Turkey. They are Muslims like I am. And they are from Turkey. And they are based, their company is based in Maine's in biotech. So I think we, 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 we get stronger if we embrace diversity and inclusion. So let's little bit talk a little bit about the Moderna vaccine. Both are mRNA vaccines. The, I'm sorry, the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Both are mRNA. They're slightly different mRNAs. Moderna has, you know, what, what they do is they take a whole bunch of proteins and they give them numbers and see which one would be good. So the Moderna used uh, 12, MRA 1273 and BioNTech uses mRNA BNT 162B2. Another one that came very close was BNT162B1, but that didn't, was not as good as B2, so that's why that went into trials. As I mentioned several times, the mRNA is enclosed in the lipid nanoparticle, and once you, the, we, we need this, the, the mRNA is so fragile, you needed something protection to deliver it. You need a delivery system for that. Uh, as Dr. Haley mentioned, the, the, the dose for uh, BioNTech, uh, for vaccine is day zero and day 21. The AC, ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices gave a plus minus four day leeway there for that. And the Moderna vaccine is zero to 28 days. I don't know what leeway they will give, but they will give a leeway so people can get that vaccine. Uh, Moderna, uh, again, evaluated for disease. And remember this term, disease for 14 days post uh, the second dose and the BioNTech was seven days post the second dose. Neither of these vaccines evaluated for protection against infection. And that becomes very important. We, you, and when you get the vaccine, that is not a passport to you now say, oh, I don't need the mask. I need to do social distancing, any of that. Even those people who get the vaccine must continue to wear a mask, must continue to have uh, 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 social distancing, and must continue to do smart isolations when needed. So I think we need to remember all of these things. I, uh, let me take this opportunity, uh, Rogers, you asked about mandating. Remember, these vaccines are not approved fully. They are EUA, emergency use authorization only. So they are not considered fully approved. I think there are some legal reasons that you cannot even mandate these vaccines. So that difference between infection and disease is very important. Where these trials were set up, the two that uh, Moderna and Pfizer trials, and Moderna didn't look at the infection, but by and large, the way they were set up is you got the vaccine and then you only were tested for SARS-CoV if you had disease. So if you were asymptomatic and you got the infection, then you were not tested. That's why we can say that these vaccines protect you against infection. Now, the Moderna vaccine looked at a little bit and we'll have more information about tomorrow when the FDA meets to discuss this because that's going to be a, a important question. But even then, there are not enough data for us to say, even if you get the Moderna vaccine, that you can actually uh, get lax about your uh, masks and uh, social distancing and uh, smart isolation. So whenever there is a vaccine, uh, but especially about COVID vaccine, especially because of the speed with which it was made. Now remember, no shortcuts were taken. I think that's extremely important. Yes, it, it, we are part of that. It's called Operation Warp Speed, right? The Star Trek fans know what warp is. So they moved it faster, put billions of dollars into it, but no shortcuts were taken. That's very important to know. So the critical thing is safety, adverse effects, and efficacy. And important thing, of course, as, is tolerability, reactogenicity, and expectation. And we have a vaccine which why we know that at least for three, four months that we have studied it is safe. We know that it is efficacious 
and we know that they are not the, the adverse effects are not significant in the vaccine group compared to the placebo group. Now, the efficacy is different from effectiveness. Efficacy is what you see in the control environment of a trial. Effectiveness is what you see in the real world. So we'll find out what the effectiveness of the vaccine. We know what the efficacy of the vaccines is. It was 90% initially for Pfizer, 94.5% for Moderna, and then subsequent data when it was gathered for Pfizer, it was also 95%. When I, in this slide, when I say expectations, I mean managing the expectations of tolerability and uh, reactogenicity. This is a slide by so somebody from uh, Emory, Dr. Haley may know this doctor, uh, that the, the, this shows you comparisons. So what you have here is Shingris. Those of us who have gotten Shingris must have rem may remember that how we had react reactogenicities. The, then this is the Pfizer uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. This is the influ influenza vaccine. Flu cell vax and this is placebo. As you can see, even in placebo, they are when you inject placebo, there is some response, some reactogenicity. Now, reactogenicity is not necessarily bad. You know, I have a friend who is in, in one of the vaccine trials, and when she got the vaccine, she said, she called me, said, I got the vaccine, I got the vaccine. What are you excited? I said, Well, how do you know? She said, Well, I had a sore arm and I, I feel crappy with. Uh, myalgia, fever, fatigue. So she said, I got the vaccine. So by the way, use that word crappy. That's a scientific medical word for the vaccine. You'll feel crappy for 12 to 48 hours, may feel crappy for 12 to 48 hours after you get the vaccine. And we need to tell that to people because that's an expectation. As Dr. Haley said, you need two doses. So you go, you get your first dose and you feel crappy and you say, I'm not getting the second dose. Well, that doesn't work. And there was also some misinformation that you have protection after the first dose and people thought you may need only that. Uh, this came out from an article that was published in New York Times. What the, really what Pfizer said is after the first dose, you are protected until you get the second dose for the long-term protection. They don't have any data that people who got just one dose of the Pfizer vaccine and see if they were protected or not. But the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that Shingris, which I know I got it and I can tell you, on, I got it on a Friday and on Saturday, I knew it's going to make you make me feel uh, crappy. I didn't realize how much. And on Saturday, I mean, I was in bed uh, for most of the day. It, it really made me sick. So we need to explain this to the, our communities. That's very, it's, it's in my mind, that's extremely important. Well, as you all know, healthcare personnel uh, are the first ones for this vaccine. Healthcare systems, public health uh, uh, should work together as they are, as Dr. Haley said, that's a vaccine access to healthcare personnel who are not affiliated with hospitals. We have to go to the hospitals first and then it has to go out to the community. And that will happen. I know Rogers, like yourself, I've got many friends and colleagues who are calling me, when am I getting my vaccine? And I'm saying, I, not, not yet. I, I'll give you one other example. This is important. I think my personal ethics forced me to not to get the vaccine this week and next week. And there's a reason for that. I'm not involved in direct patient care. It's not that I don't want the vaccine. I want people to get the vaccine who are really at the highest risk. I'm at risk also, and I'm going to get it next week. But this week, I mean, one of my colleagues called me and he said, he, well, he can't get an uh, appointment this week. Uh, uh, and he said, well, that's okay, get it for next week. So, I mean, there's only, so, I mean, Dr. Haley said, we gave 700 vaccines today. That's a lot of shots. A lot of vaccines, so it, you know, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of uh, logistics to. So I think I made that as a personal choice. As my ethical compass said, you can wait. You are not as much as risk as that person in, who is in the ED or the person who you know other people in the COVID unit. So, uh, but I, I I will get that vaccine. I think we also talked about we need to consider staggering vaccination for of, uh, personnel so the same unit doesn't get it. But we need to do the same thing in the households. You know, household is like a, 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 a unit, right? If you, if mom and dad both get sick on Saturday and, and who's going to take the kids to the soccer game or whatever else they have to go to or who's going to cook and all of that. So I think even in homes, you may want to stagger that uh, so that, uh, you know, you're not feeling sick and, you know, not having the reactogenicity all at the same time. And I think there's, there's some of these things are uh, intuitive, but we have to think about that and plan that accordingly. The allocation of the COVID vaccine, we get this question all the time. And, uh, and I think it's important to know that there is a science behind. And the science has already been done. You know, who's the, we have the COVID disease burden. We look at the balance of benefits and harms of the vaccine. And we already know that. That's the FDA approval. That's the ACIP thing. And then there is the implementation part of it. And that's not straightforward either. 
who 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 are the values uh, of target group you know what are their values that's why we need to talk to people who may have some distrust out there we need to get not just develop trust but be trustworthy and i think that's important and also we need to look at the feasibility you can't give it to everybody at the same time that's just not possible and of course the ethics at to my in my mind ethics should be the first you need to maximize benefit and minimize harms and we need to maximize benefit and minimize harm for individuals and for the society and that's very important that's where the ethical issues are so important uh, we need to promote justice who are the highest risk in the community whether it's healthcare providers the firefighters the police where you are it is going to be different new york city is going to give a vaccine to its uh, police department uh, i think starting tomorrow or friday maybe uh, mitigate health inequities i think that's key as as uh, dr right said you know health equities have always uh, always existed but really the this pandemic made this ugly head rise even higher and we need to promote transparency i think that's key we have to tell people what we know and we have to tell people what we don't know it's okay to say i don't know but this is what i know so for example there's just a report today that there's already an uh, 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 anaphylactic reaction to one of the recipients in alaska the cdc is going to investigate that that's going to happen so when you give the vaccine to 30 to 40 to 60000 people in a trial you will find some more common more likely adverse events when you give it to you know 3000 4000 6000 600 3000 400 600 000 people you will find more when you give it to 3 300 600 million people it's more when you give it to give it to 7 billion people in the world you are really going to find some of the effects that you are never able to find uh, for the vaccine now the other point to make is most adverse events for vaccines that's all vaccines that we have usually occur in the first 6 to 8 weeks that's something very important to remember and for both the vaccines that are going to be approved we have already passed that 4 4 to 6 4 to 6 to 8 week period now that doesn't mean that can be some uh, side effects later on but most adverse events occur early so i think and and when i talk about adverse events i'm not talking about reactogenicity that is to be expected i'm talking about things that are not to be expected but keep in mind for example for influenza uh, the vaccine you worry about gyan bare okay let's talk think about it for there is a case of uh, gyan bare for every 1 uh, to 300 cases of uh, uh, influenza but there's only one case of gyan bare for every a million to 300 3 million doses of vaccines given so the benefit of the vaccine is outweighs any harm it can cause even for, like looking at this gyan bare and many other things so i think those are sorts of things we need to be thinking about and letting people know i'm not going to go into this detail all of you know about it but i just thought i'll show you this slide now here's the speculation if all goes well as planned and hopefully we don't bungle it i you know we are in good hands with the uh, locally with dr haley and the others but you know we, they are at the end of this uh, supply chain really <laughs> there's a whole bunch of things i'm also very confident since military is managing logistics i think that'll be good so the first part is already done by january 2021 i hope second dose is for frontline healthcare workers february march 2021 people more than 65 years especially more than 75 years and with medical conditions essential workers which are education don't forget the uh, education system our kids need to go back to school it, it's not good for them not to be in school law enforcement then by april june 2021 most other groups should be available exactly what happened that remains to be seen i'm very confident very hopeful unfortunately i think murphy is going to be around and so expect some delays be patient there may be delays that's part of the whole process my hope wish and pray is that by end of december 2021 most people will be vaccinated and it will be back to what we we will have this meeting face to face next year uh i'm just one more two, two more slides jaslyn uh so what vaccine does and does not do this is probably one of the most important slide one dose only protects until the second dose it protects against disease the vaccine protects against disease not not infection vaccinated may get infected and transmit the infection standard coronavirus precautions still must apply and we still don't know about long term uh, long term protection but we learn as we get the vaccines the study participants are longer and longer and longer period so we will have more time and The, the, I'm only going to address the first bullet, Jocelyn, because that's something. There's some misinformation. The mRNA vaccine does not change your genetic code. There's some misinformation about that. It's like a U. Look, look at the mRNA mRNA vaccine, like a USB port, right? USB drive is inserted into the computer. That's your body. 
It does not impact the hard drive. The, yeah, that's your genetic code, your DNA. But then it runs a certain program that produces antibodies and spike proteins, and then it's, it's, uh, it's done. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you for your patience. I did try to cut down as much as I possible. It's a very large subject, so I appreciate your patience. Thank you, Dr. Rathor. Um, uh, some of the questions that I have for you, you pretty much answered, but I can ask a couple. So uh, we know that the mRNA vaccine doesn't cause COVID-19. However, can you tell me, uh, do you have any idea how long immunity uh, may last after the vaccine? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think so. anybody knows. We hope that it lasts, well, we hope that it lasts a long time. We hope that you, we are only going to need this vaccine one time, but we may need it annually like the flu vaccine. But we do know, and as I said, you know, as you get the vaccines, right now it, when it was initially reported was three months, now we just protected it for four months. And, you know, next month will be five months. So we will slowly know these groups will be followed, uh, the participants will be followed for two years. Uh, if you remember the HPV vaccine, those people have been for, for, for 10, 15, 20 years. Hepatitis B vaccine for 30 years. That's why we know we don't need, need boosters for them. So all of these uh, participants will be followed. And I think that's why we have to be honest. We don't know that. We expect it to be protective. We don't know if you're going to need it annually or not, but we will know all those uh, answers to all those questions later on. Another question. Uh, is there a benefit to taking more than one vaccine? So you took the Moderna version, uh, yeah. Should we be able to take uh, the Pfizer version? Or yeah. Will it offer any additional protection? Right. The CDC recommends that you should, if you get the Pfizer vaccine first dose, get it the second dose also. But once the Moderna vaccine gets approved and somebody gets the Pfizer vaccine and inadvertently gets the second dose of the Moderna vaccine, they are not recommending that you get a third dose of one or the other vaccine. Just so, But there is no interchangeability right now. Uh, for the vaccine it, as it is with some of the other vaccines. But we learn more about and ultimately there'll be trials. The ma major thing is going to be these are two messenger RNA vaccines. When we have a whole different class of vaccines, we will know even less. Um, okay. Um, okay, well, I think that you pretty much covered, you did an excellent job covering most of what, especially our scientists, uh, what we look at. Um, uh, that we've, uh, you've done an excellent job covering that. Um, is there anybody else that has questions? Um, we are having a panel, and just like with um, uh, Dr. Haley, we invite you to stay around and because there may be some questions that the people in the audience may be asking, and you guys may be more, uh, much more capable of answering than I can. Okay. Sure. Good evening, Rogers. Hey, yes. Hey. Uh, yeah, hi, good evening. Um, I'm just checking, what about people who have had BCG vaccine? Was there people in the study that also had BCG vaccine and what was their immune response? Uh, so I, I don't know the exact numbers on answers for them, but these studies have not only been done in the Western world, they've also been done in India and in South Africa and other parts of the world where BCG vaccine is routinely given to everybody at birth. I have scars to show for it. I'm sure Dr. Gale also got it when he was born. Uh, and uh, so I have not heard of any uh, problems with that uh, or any issues with that so far. But again, that's a very specific question. I, that, that would be what we will call a, sub, uh, a subclass analysis. Uh, but I think we will probably hear more about that uh, but right now, there is nothing to suggest that those of us who have got, gotten BCG, we would be responding to any less. But the other thing about BCG is it doesn't really last very long. It's not that great of a vaccine. Uh, but uh, anyways, that's the answer. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, is there any benefit? Will there be any benefit to people who have already had COVID? And then when, if, if and when should they get vaccinated? Uh, um, <clears throat> for COVID, if, if yeah. there is an additional vaccination yeah, the requirement. The current recommendation is people should be uh, immunized without regards for their previous COVID infection or presence of antibodies. Having said that, uh, the most important thing is you should not get COVID vaccine while you are having acute COVID infection. That's similar to all other, if you have acute influenza infection, you should not get any vaccine. Uh, you can, if you, have, uh, if you have had COVID, you can defer it up to 90 days because you probably have antibodies for 90 days. And what that means is that uh, you, you are probably protected. Your chances of reinfection are a little. But if you, if you have antibodies and you get the vaccine, there is no harm. 
Uh, there's some concern about uh, issues which are only theoretical. So at this point in time, if you have had the COVID infection, don't forget we do that if you have had pertussis vaccine infection, whoop, whooping cough, we still give you the vaccine. So mm -hmm. you should still get the vaccine, but you can probably defer it uh, for about up to 90 days. And I think that may more be more important to say that, you know, those, you know, you're a little bit protected so let other people get the chance. Okay. I turn this back over to Jocelyn. Thank you, Dr. Rathor and Dr. Kane. Dr. Rathor, as always, you enlighten us so much with your wealth of knowledge. We really appreciate it. And I'd like to invite you to stick around as well as we're gonna start the panel discussion. And at this time, I would like to introduce a few wonderful folks that I've had the pleasure of working with over the years. But the first one I've not met yet, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Gale. Dr. Gale is a pediatric critical care physician who is an associate professor, professor of pediatrics at the University of Florida College of Medicine, Jacksonville. He is also the chief of pediatric critical care at UFCOM Jacksonville and Wolfson Children's Hospital. He serves as the medical director for the outreach program of Wolfson, a regional referral pediatric hospital and is a medical director of Wolfson Children's Hospital Pediatric Transport Program, Kids Care, which brings children from within a 150 mile radius to Wolfson for medical and surgical care. As medical director of the Wolfson Children's Hospital Outreach Program, he educates hospital executives and physicians about the medical experts and programs at Wolfson. Born in Kingston, Jamaica, Dr. Gale has a wealth of experience in pediatric and pediatric critical care medicine. He received his medical degree from the University of the West Indies in Kingston. He completed his pediatric residency at the University of Calgary, Alberta Children's Hospital and Foothills Hospital in Alberta, Canada. Welcome Dr. Gale. Dr. Kim Barbell Johnson is a Mayo Clinic Jacksonville residency trained family physician. She has served in various leadership roles in community organization and academic medicine over the past 25 years of her medical career. She currently serves as the senior physician investigator and medical trials director for clinical at Care Partners Clinical Research, a division of Family Care Partners. She has been the principal investigator for more than 70 clinical trials, including vaccine trials. She has been a consultant to the biopharma industry on matters of sickle cell disease and chronic kidney disease education, diversity in clinical trials and community engagement. She currently leads the occupational health and COVID-19 workplace exposure risk mitigation efforts for nearly 300 employees at Family Care Partners. Welcome, Dr. Johnson. Dr. Vincy Samuels has been the System Director of Employee Health since July 2015. She has a PhD and Master's in Public Health with a specialization in epidemiology and a bachelor's degree in biology from Florida International University. Dr. Samuel is board certified in infection prevention and control by the Certification Board of Infection Control and Epidemiology. She began her career at Baptist Health in 2013 as a clinical epidemiologist. Prior to Baptist Health, she completed the Florida Epidemic Intelligence Service Fellowship at the Florida Department of Health. She has held various public health roles for the department, Miami-Dade County Public Schools, Florida International University, and Florida Heart Research Institute. She has spent much of the last 12 years of her career primarily focused on vaccine preventable diseases, emerging pathogens, and disease outbreaks, including tuberculosis, West Nile virus, food and waterborne illness, influenza, so on and so forth. Dr. Kelly Tice Wells, my former boss, is a family physician with a background in public health who serves as Florida Blue's Senior Medical Director for Medical Affairs. In this role, Dr. Tice Wells oversees the company's health equity strategy and has responsibilities in the areas of corporate social responsibility, addressing social determinants of health and public health surveillance. She currently serves as a critical lead for Florida Blue's COVID-19 response. 
Dr. Tice Wells was a National Service Corps scholar and completed her service commitment in Duval County as a County Health Department physician. Early in her medical career, Dr. Tice Wells became interested in addressing health disparities and delivering culturally competent care. Before joining Florida Blue in 2018, she spent 17 years as a public health physician serving in numerous leadership roles, including that of County Health Officer, State Medical Director for the Florida Department of Health and Chair of the State's Equity Program Council. At this time, I would like to ask our presenters a few questions. Oh, and Dr. Rogers Kane is also going to join the panel. I'd like to start with Dr. Wells. Dr. Wells, why are African Americans and we've and our previous presenters has talked about it, but can you add any more insight as to why African Americans and other minorities most at risk of contracting the virus and have a are most at risk and have a higher risk of dying from it? Sure, uh, thank you. I think uh, certainly Dr. Haley uh, touched on this and those of us who have done equity work from either the clinical perspective or from the social justice uh, perspective have long known that these issues existed. Uh, in fact, there are um, decades long initiatives to address health disparities because we recognize that minorities uh, tend to um, uh, have earlier diagnosis of chronic disease and, and because of issues related to access and the ability to adopt and maintain healthy behaviors, um, tend to have uh, those illnesses and conditions that are uh, much poorly uh, controlled. Um, one of the, the pieces of advice that I have given to uh, numerous folks since the pandemic began is you, know, you wanna be certain that if you come into contact with COVID-19, that you, it finds you in your best state of health, right? It, it, that decreases your risk of having significant complications. But because of the things that we outlined in terms of chronic disease and the fact that more minorities are, pre are um, in the essential fields, in healthcare, in retail, uh, in hospitality, uh, working in restaurants, their ability to do what many of us were able to do, um, which is uh, it really limit our exposures. Uh, some of us became uh, remote workers very quickly. Uh, their ability to mitigate their own risks really was never present. And, and so you combine those two things um, and add to that a, a poor understanding or a mistrust of the systems of services. And here we are with these, dis these glaring disparate impacts. What all of us who have done this work for years agreed and knew right away was uh, once this door was opened and, and there was this attention certainly uh, being paid to health disparities globally for the very first time, we were going to walk through that door and ensure that through conversations like this and through collective efforts, we were going to be able to address that. Thank you. Dr. Gale, what are the, and you know, this is a very hot question, but what are the benefits of wearing a mask? And, and can you explain, are we protecting ourselves or others? Uh, thank you very much for that question. So uh, when pandemic started, uh, you know, there was some controversy about mask wearing. Uh, the, the CDC initially uh, then recommended masks to be worn uh, by individuals, which it was thought initially to protect uh, the folks that they uh, a person with COVID came in contact with. Uh, there was no uh, initial information about whether the, the mask actually protect the wearer as well. But subsequently, uh, we have found out that the mask not only protect the wearer, I mean, sorry, the persons um, who the, the person with COVID come in contact with, but we now know that the mask protects the wearer as well. So the mask uh, does provide protection against um, the, the recipient wearing a mask, having you know contracting COVID, as well as protecting others. So it's certainly very, very important um, that masks be worn uh, by everyone in you know who are outside of their their, their homes and uh, and that social and social distancing as well. So so the type of mask may may affect um, the 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 risk of the infection, but but cloth masks are are just as important as the surgical mask. And one thing I should mention that, uh, you know, some folks keep repeating wearing a mask, but the cloth mask should be washed after every two to three days um, for it to be effective as well. And that is important to say, and I'm, I'm glad you say that because we get a lot of mixed messages about 
wearing masks. Dr. Gail, I'd also like to follow up with, you know, there are many families who live in the same household, multi-generational. Some, you know, the, the grandparent is at home and may have some health issues and the parents are going out to work and children are going out to school. How can families protect themselves as they are going out and coming back home to, as far as uh, decreasing the risk of exposure? Well, that's a very tough question, especially for our um, lower socioeconomic uh, community who live in a, you know, a small uh, residences when you, you have multi-generational families, which basically mean you may have uh, um, some kids, uh, parents and grandparents. And one or more, of course, of the grandparents may have a chronic condition such as kidney disease or um, some uh, diabetes or, or some other condition which would make them a lot more at risk. So it's a very, very challenging situation. But I think um, in, in, in the more affluent families who live in a bigger home, um, it's, it's obviously easier for them to be uh, spread out. But if you live in a smaller home, uh, I think they, the things that I would recommend are, are we call them the, the three Ws, uh, you know, wash your hands, uh, wear your mask, and maintain social distancing. So everyone who live in that household, um, including the kids, need to follow those Ws of washing hands, um, um, wearing a mask and keeping social distances. We know that kids um, do get the infection, uh, fortunately at a low, much lower rate than adults do. So, so the idea of the kids going to school and, and maintaining those three Ws uh, is very important that they do that. So when they come home, again, I would suggest that they, they do wash their hands when they get home. The adults who go to work, you know, do the same thing, wash their hands, wear the mask and social distancing. Um, if one of those members um, in the household, whoever gets um, the infection, then there is a challenge to where, you know, how do you um, take care of that family? Well, they, the, one of the first things that that person with infection needs to be wearing a mask inside the home. Um, that, that, that individual would need to be um, kept in a, a room, if possible, by himself or herself. Um, if they have a share room, that, that room needs to be kept ventilated, windows open if possible. Certainly in Florida, we can afford to keep the windows open and you know, keep the surfaces clean, you know, using a lot of um, you know, alcohol and other types of antiseptic um, agents. So it's, it, I think the same principles involved uh, in the multi-generation as it involves in any, any other family. You know, wash your hands, uh, um, you know, wear your mask and keep social distancing. So that's the double. There, there, are, there are three other things that for the adults, I, I would also recommend. There are the three Vs. When you're outside of your home, you know, you know, the, the three Vs will be, you know, what venues are you going to be, you know, avoid eating indoors. Um, uh, and so if you want to eat outside, the adults in that family should avoid eating indoors, eat outdoors. They should be in a place that is well ventilated and, and they should avoid um, places where there are a lot of um, what we call uh, uh, vocalization, singing, um, you know, people speaking mm -hmm. without masks and so on. So the, the three Vs that the adults should practice and, if, and everybody should practice the three Ws. Those are some very good, important tips, and I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned you have the, the acronyms, the Vs and the Ws, and again, great information because most families don't have the luxury of staying at home. They do need to go and work with for their families and provide for them and to even share the information about if a family member becomes infected, how to protect oneself within the homes. Thank you very much. Dr. Wells, I'm gonna ask you another question. Do you know if there are any plans, and it may have been spoken earlier, but any plans of vaccinating the indigent or homeless populations? So I think both of the, the, uh, the previous speakers talked a little bit about the need and the risk for those particular groups. And, and I can tell you that as these plans were developed at the national level and then um, pushed out through the, the states, there was the requirement that there be um, specific provisions for groups like, like you described. That the challenge is always, you know, the devil in, is in the details. It is the implementation of that at the local level, right? We're talking about something uh, for which the initial supplies are going to be uh, very tightly maintained, very small, um, and we've got large numbers of folks that need to be vaccinated. And we certainly saw in this community 
that at the start of the pandemic, there were uh, shortages of, for instance, testing materials, and it was the homeless population, um, and specifically some of our partners who were providing care to that population, that really couldn't get their hands on tests. Um, and, and the solution that Dr. Haley alluded to was to take the, the testing into some of those communities and, and partner specifically to address that. So yes, the plan exists and, and the, um, the requirement is there that those uh, populations are cared for. I would ask uh, those of you who are advocates in the community and are paying attention to this, uh, be sure that you understand how it's being solved in the community and, and be certain that, that you give voice to the folks who may not be at the table you know, as these things are being distributed. Thank you. And you, know, you think about the different types of vaccines for instance, the Pfizer, I believe, is, is two dosages and Moderna, Moderna is one. So it's probably important then when that when the time comes for the fa that phase of vaccine distribution that the population that's homeless or maybe transient, they may be more apt to get the Moderna vaccine, for instance, rather than the than the Pfizer. Well, the Moderna vaccine also requires two doses. Oh, it does? Uh, so okay. The Pfizer is going to be two doses, 21 days apart, which would be, you know, a bit of a challenge for a, a population that might be hard to, to kind of track. Mm -hmm. um, the Moderna, Moderna vaccine, you've got 28 days, but there are a few, dose, a few vaccines that are coming in the pipeline that will only require one dose. Um, and, and to your point, that might be a better offering. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wells, Tice Wells. Dr. Samuels. Young adults engaging in social activities at crowded house parties and bars are all over social, social media and in the news. What would you say to them about their behavior? First and foremost, I would say that we all need to do our part. So in general, the more closely you interact with others and the longer that interaction, the higher the risk of COVID-19 spread. So we have been seeing an increase in cases even before Thanksgiving, and we continue to see a rise post Thanksgiving. So when we decide to engage in public activities, we really should take all possible uh, precautions. And so that means continuing to protect ourselves by practicing everyday preventive actions. So wearing a mask, social distancing, frequent hand hygiene, avoid touching your face with unclean hands and disinfecting surfaces. And so in our current state, we really need to assume everyone is positive and protect ourselves accordingly. So when we oversee all of our exposed and positive team members, um, such as what we do here at Baptist Health and all of our other organizations across our community, we see plenty of situations in which someone unfortunately attended a party or event while they were positive and then transmitted the virus to the other attendee. So you typically don't go to the event thinking that you're going to get it, but that's a risk that you take. Um, and then you pass it on to others. So it's really just doing our part and trying to make sure we're taking all possible precautions at all times. And as a follow-up, Dr. Samuel, how do we ask our family and friends to respect social distancing? That's a great question. So it's creating and communicating our boundaries. Figure out what you're most comfortable with. Identify your own rules. So if you decide that you're going to go to a family gathering, it's that you'll only go if it's outdoors and that it's socially distant. Um, and then communicate your rules clearly to let others know where you stand. I think always setting boundaries can be uncomfortable and you don't need to give a lengthy explanation, but you do need to believe in the boundary that you set, remain confident and state it in a firm but kind way. Yeah, and we know that living in Florida, we have the luxury of, and I think maybe even Dr. Gale mentioned it, you know, leaving our windows open and we take advantage of, of pretty good weather. So knowing that people are probably wanting to plan family gatherings coming up, what advice would you give them to help plan a safe and uh, family gathering, obviously to decrease exposure? Yeah, so we have been doing a lot of that type of education with the holidays, especially being here. And so we've been trying to educate our employees and our community in the best and safest way to do this. First and foremost, it's reminding guests to stay home if they are sick. So if they've got the 
sniffle, so, um, sore throat, any type of symptoms that, you know, are indicating some type of illness, they really shouldn't come to the event because we see a lot of people with mild symptoms that end up being positive later. Um, encouraging social distancing, so being outdoors is always the best place to be if you are going to have a gathering. And even when you're outdoors, you sh should still social distance. Um, wearing a mask if you are going to be within six feet of other people or if you're going to be indoors. Frequent hand hygiene, so consider putting um, hand hygiene stations around so that um, people are encouraged to go ahead and perform hand hygiene as often as possible. Limit the number of people that you're going to have over and then how you're serving food. It's always best if it could be, you know, individually wrapped and already set out versus um, everyone touching the same utensils and in a potluck type of manner. And then just thinking to yourself to limit contact with commonly touched surfaces or shared items. So if you have a touchless garbage can, for example, that's a great idea versus everyone touching a lid. Um, and then whatever it is we touch again, those hand hygiene stations are very important so that people will um, do frequent hand hygiene and avoid touching their face with unclean hands. And those are great tips. And the one thing I like about it, you, you're, you, all of you have been pretty consistent with how we, those basic things that we can do in terms of not touching our face with unclean hands, the social distancing, wearing masks, those are all important things. But you know, as Floridians, as Southerners, we're so touchy, feely and huggy and just wanna, you know, I see a lot of people doing air bumps uh, at uh, elbow bumps at each other in the air. And so those are some great tips to help folks plan. Uh, and one thing that you mentioned that I'd like to, and this was, uh, I just thought of this, Dr. Samuel, as you were talking, and I'd like to ask any of our speakers to answer the question because some people, may get confused how do you know how do they know if they actually have the virus versus having the flu or just a common cold well the number one way would be to get tested yeah makes sense anyone else would anyone else like to chime in on that pretty much it <laughs> that's it get tested that's pretty much it. the only way to know you got to get tested and you know, I, I was with talking to a group recently and some folks still didn't know where they can go for testing. So I think to encourage people to pay attention to the news, listen to the radio, go on social media. We all go on social media for social reasons, but also there are some legitimate sources that have been placing messages on social media like the Centers for Disease Control and locally, the city of Jacksonville, 630-2489, the Florida Department of Health. They're trusted sources that you can call to ask where you can get tested. Dr. Johnson, how, and, and you know, we've talked to, no, I'm sorry, Dr. Kane, forgive me. Dr. Kane, will I get any side effects from the vaccine as I do from the flu vaccine? You know, some people will say, well, I got the flu vaccine and I got the flu. And so, you know, what do you say about that for people who are considering getting the, the, the vaccine, the coronavirus vaccine? Short answer is yes, you probably get uh, some, some side effects, um, but it's person dependent. I got the flu, pneumonia, and the shingrest all in the same day, no symptoms. A little bit of soreness on one of the arms. But then I have other people who got the shingrest uh, or and flu, and they develop symptoms. So it's, it's, it's probably individualized uh, as to whether or not that person will or will not have, uh, experience symptoms. Uh, but I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. Uh, having those symptoms is better than being infected with COVID and having to spend time in the uh, ICU, emergency room, wherever it might be, if you're lucky to survive. So uh, give me the symptoms any day. It's only going to last about 48 hours or so. And uh, But the short answer is yes, you're probably going to get symptoms. And maintain a relationship with your primary care physician so that you can can talk to them about you know what's happening with you. Would you suggest that? 
since I'm a primary care physician, I'm supposed to say, I'm supposed to say yes. A lot of times, <laughs> it may not be anything I can do for them except offer them some Motrin or Tylenol or something along that line. And also and some advice. The vaccinate, yeah. And thank them for getting vaccinated so that they cannot become vectors themselves and that they will survive the COVID uh, epidemic or uh, pandemic that we experience. So we've learned tonight that you're going to have to have two dosages of the vaccine. So there are going to be some folk who are going to get, who may get sick rather after the first dosage and say, I'm not going through that again. What advice would you give to them, Dr. Kane, to make sure that they do get that second dosage of the vaccine? Oh, to make sure that they get it. That's a, that's a difficult one, but you know, the, a lot of times, well, being truly transparent, the second dose of vaccine may make them sicker than the first dose. <laughs> um, but they need to get the second dose to be fully protected. So why go through getting the first dose, get sick, uh, and then decide not to get the second dose where you will get the level of protection that you saw in the first place. So I'm just going to tell them to, you know, check it up and go and get the, get the second dose. Yeah, and, 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 and that's tough. And I think the more that we have conversations like this, the more that we trust, we trust trusted sources of information, then people will hopefully adhere to what the recommendations are. Dr. Wells, I'd like to follow up with a question to you. For some folks who've already had COVID-19 and recovered, do they still need to get vaccinated when the time becomes available for them? Absolutely, yes. And, and see, that's a great question because I think one of the things that we're beginning to, to notice is that um, as folks are just getting tired of having to maintain the, the social distancing and, and you know, um, the things necessary to protect themselves from COVID spread, some folks have are, are, have the misconception that once they've had it, then you know everything is is kind of okay, um, and that's just not correct. You know, I think there, we we do realize that there is for a period of time there is an immunity that comes after having had COVID nineteen, uh, but it's not long term. And the current recommendation is that if if you've had it, even if you've had it, the expectation should be that you should uh, stand in line to receive a, a vaccine when it's available to you. Um, and, I, and I just want to point out that, that one of the things, I think probably the thing that is most valuable about this is the, the collaborative work that, um, that is involved in solving for some of these problems. You know, just in the discussion we've had um, tonight, uh, thinking about how to manage it for, uh, manage access for those that might be um, less advantaged, uh, thinking about how we can uh, duplicate messages, you know, so at Florida Blue, um, you know, we want to become that that trusted resource of information, but often we're pointing to sources of truth and just amplifying those messages. And so I, I love the synergy that exists because I think that's really where, you know, if we're all talking to our various spheres of influence, then we can be sure that folks who only get their information from social media, for instance, will have access to the same quality of information that others who were more well informed might. I'm glad you said that, Dr. Dr. Wells. Um, just a second, Dr. Kane. Dr. Wells, I'm glad you said that because that's one thing that I've been proud of is our local healthcare system has been very transparent at how they are communicating with one another. And you know, the fact that a you know, for Dr. Haley, for instance, to go on television and show himself getting vaccinated. And now as it's rolling out to other hospitals, I'm sure they're gonna do the same. And that's important because it's showing that we're all on the same page. They're all on the same page. So that's a that's a very good point. Dr. Kane, did you have something to follow up? Well, once, once uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Tice, well, I just call her Kelly. Once Dr. Kelly, <laughs> once, once Kelly, since she brought that up, um, I just wanted to make sure this is a chance for me to mention that, you know, we have a public health consortium, uh, population health consortium, uh, in which we're bringing together um, a multidisciplinary, multi-sectorial medical, mental health, uh, nursing, social workers, dental and other organizations that we want to get that information out to them 
because we're trying to advocate uh, for the uh, uh, to eliminate health inequities in the Northeast Florida community in particular. So one of the things, one of the reasons that uh, myself and Dr. Goldhagen brought together this this team of really smart people, really uh, uh, dedicated uh, individuals and organizations is to try to make sure there is health equity uh, and, and the elimination of the health inequities in the Northeast Florida area. So we probably will be reaching out to many of you guys in terms of trying to bring you on board so that we can be a source of, of a reference and a source of information that people can pretty much look at and say, there's transparency, this is a trustworthy organization, and I know where to go get some answers from. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Dr. Gale, this question is for you. Should pregnant women and children get the vaccine? Unmute, Dr. Gale. And you got Dr. Cody on here. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Uh, currently, the uh, um, Pfizer vaccine is recommended for pregnant women. Uh, children, uh, and Dr. Arthur didn't touch on this, but uh, the studies that have been done so far with Pfizer, uh, it's only recommended for children 16 and over. So the age, low limb for now is 16. I think for the Moderna, it will be down to 12, if I'm not mistaken. There are um, studies going on. I think Dr. Rathor's group is going to be involved in those studies of some other um, vaccines that will be uh, conducted on children. So currently, uh, children uh, up to 16, um, below 16 and over, over will be vaccinated. And with Moderna, I think it's with 12 and over. Uh, for pregnancy, um, I, the, the CDC does recommend that uh, uh, pregnant women be vaccinated. Uh, but I think I would recommend that the, uh, women who are pregnant check with their obstetrician before they uh, go ahead and get vaccinated. Great, thank you. Dr. Cody, you look like you're just itching to say something. Am I wrong? Are you okay for now? So I've gotten so many questions about uh, the vaccination. Pfizer had, non, had no pregnant women in their studies. And so as always with obstetrics, there's concern about liability, litigation, et cetera. Uh, as Dr. Gale said, each person is going to have to talk with their doctors about it. The maternal medicine fetal doctors right now in Jacksonville have not been advocates of the vaccination and pregnancy just yet. Uh, Thank uh, Justin Mess. Dr. Cody is a local OBGYN, correct, Dr. Cody? Yes, retired. Retired. Justin, this is Mobin. Can I just make a comment? Absolutely. Dr. Cody is correct. There were no uh, uh, pregnancy was an exclusion criteria for the Pfizer vaccine, and uh, but there were 23 women who got pregnant during the study, and those were 23 women. It's a small, small number, but I thought I'll mention that, and they did well. They are going to be followed for their outcomes of pregnancy and for the, the, the babies, uh, and uh, and for the women themselves. And Moderna even had fewer. Uh, I asked at the last meeting of the uh, uh, COVID prevention network. Uh, that uh, and the Moderna even had fewer uh, women who got pregnant. Uh, the uh, ACOG has come up with the recommendation that the pregnant women should be immunized, and the Society for Maternal Fetal, Maternal Fetal Medicine is also recommending that the pregnant women get the vaccine. But Dr. Cody is right; we don't we don't have uh, that much information on this. What we do know is the coronavirus does not cause perinatal infections, at least not that has been well confirmed, and it is not. Uh, uh, go through the uh, breast milk. So, uh, so, so at this point in time, uh, the CDC recommends that pregnant women and those lactating women uh, can get the vaccine. But I share Dr. Cody's concern that we don't have as much information. And for the children, the Pfizer vaccine age has been decreased to 12 years. Uh, Sanofi is also looking at uh, 12 years of age and older. Uh, we don't, there is no expectation that these vaccines would not be uh, safe and effective in uh, children 12 years and older or, or even younger children. And they, and, but obviously we have to do the studies uh, to uh, know that that's true. Uh, fortunately, as Mike said, that or Gail said, that children do, often don't get very sick, but as he can attest to, they can get very sick, they can be in the ICU and they can even die. More importantly, we have to remember that they may not get acutely ill, but six to eight 
weeks later, and we have seen many of them, they get the MISC. So, and, and most importantly, they, we need to get kids back into school. And that's so important because it's causing mental health issues, causing obesity. Uh, so I think fortunately, when we are able to uh, immunize the teachers and school personnel, I think that would be one big step to getting kids back to school uh, more effectively. So I just thought I'll make those comments, but thank you for allowing me. Thank well, you. One quick thing I'd like to make a, a point about would be, we have to also stay cognizant. A lot of kids may not get that sick. They can still be vectors in terms of bringing it back to the household, to big mama and, and, and mama and grandmother and so on and so on in those uh, multi-generational households. Thank you. I'm going to ask two more questions, and then we'll open it up to the to our, our our guests on the line. Dr. Samuel, to your knowledge, are there any laws that protect people from opting out of getting the vaccine? I know there was some conversation earlier about. I think Dr. Haley mentioned they're not mandating it for their employees, and I don't know what Baptist is doing. But do you know of any laws that will protect people from opting out of getting the vaccine? So I can speak of it a little bit more from the employer standpoint in a very general sense. Employers do have the right to require employees to get vaccinations. And besides typically some religious and health related exemptions, um, they also do have the right to maintain health and safety standards and can legally fire people who violate their rules. And that does include not getting certain vaccines. Now, having said all that, um, like was previously discussed with this being a brand new vaccine, I doubt very many are going to make this mandatory at this specific point in time. We are still learning about it and we know enough to understand its safety and efficacy at this point. Um, and so with that knowledge, we're strongly encouraging everyone to get it. Also, Johnson, as I mentioned, this is an EUA. This is not an approved vaccine. I think that's a very important fine difference. So you cannot mandate an EUA for anything. Uh, the, other, the more practical thing is there are more people who want to get, even if, as Dr. Haley said, 40% of the uh, team members at UFL uh, are, are not sure if they want to get vaccinated, but 60% do. And so we have, we, we don't have enough vaccine to immunize everybody. So anyway. I think uh, we are not at the stage that we have to, we have to start educating, but to start convincing and spending time, I think that will come also and we will have to do that. And I think the one thing that I'd like to also note that it's been said over and over again, even as the vaccine is being rolled out, we still have to make sure that we wear our mask, that we social distance, that we wash our hands, keep our unclean hands out of our faces. Those things are probably gonna be around for several months now. And most of us have been doing a pretty good job with that. And we just like to stress to everyone to keep doing that even after you are immunized or vaccinated because it is still important that we protect one another. Dr. Johnson, you've been pretty quiet. I know we started our day off early on television this morning, but I would like to ask you a question because I know you're involved a lot in clinical research. Can you speak about the demographic characteristics of patients in the two leading vaccine studies? And I have some follow-up questions as well, but I'll start with that one. Unmute yourself, please. Oh, did we lose her? There we go. Back? Yes. Thank you. I was thanking, and while on mute, Dr. Athor for answering all of the vaccine questions <laughs> I probably think of uh, in anticipation of this, uh, this event. Uh, so uh, excellent presentation there and, and such a pleasure to be here. It's been a long day, but it's been a 10 long months of long days for all of us. So this is such an incredible forum and an important topic. Um, as a a researcher, it's there's there are never enough ethnic minorities in a in a study, vaccine or otherwise, simply because uh, we we fail to enroll ethnic minorities in studies. That said, between the two studies that um, have been or will be uh, emergency use authorized uh, vaccines that will be emergency use authorized, there are about eleven thousand 
ethnic minority members uh, all told in those studies. So we do have significant representation, about 10% blocks, give or take, in both studies. Um, one, one thing I do want to ask, and I know you have follow-up questions, which I may answer, but one thing I want to add is that um, the data that we have currently is data that was uh, uh, an interim analysis from an interim analysis. So these studies like Dr. Rathor and others have said, will go on for two years. What happened in the studies, in, in the study way, randomized controlled trials, we anticipate that we'll learn a whole lot of new things as, as the uh, enrollees in these studies continue in the study. But which is more, we'll learn a whole lot more about how this vaccine performs in the true, um, we hear efficacy, but how effective this vaccine is. We'll learn that actually with time from the reporting of the symptoms, um, uh, reporting of the performance in the community as these vaccines are rolled out to members of our, of our to our community. So this is not a one and done. This is not all of the information on COVID vaccines. This is information about mRNA. We may learn new things as new vaccines are emergency use authorized and ultimately um, approved by the FDA. So it's important that we are cognizant of the data and the information that we're getting. The information that we're getting is information that we have at, at this time. And while it is extremely reassuring and I can't wait until the community of physicians in this town are able to be vaccinated so that my team, my family, myself my, uh, can actually be uh, receive the benefit of what we know thus far. This is a conversation that will continue. So yes, in addition to doing all the mask wearing and social uh, distancing, physical distancing and uh, hand washing, we must stay vigilant and cognizant and informed. Stay up with the CDC as, as new information is rolled out. Give anticipatory guidance to our patients so we don't lose them for the second dose. So that encourage them to participate in these trials so that we have people who look like me and look like us, um, many of us, as, as Dr. Rathor said, you know, it's nice that we have brown and black um, people who are scientists, um, extremely gifted and, and smart uh, in the research arena. But regardless of the color of the skin of those participants, we want the heart uh, and, and the ethics of, of, this, of the science to match. We want to make sure that we are speaking from a body of knowledge that represents fact, and not fiction, that includes people that look like us, and that um, as surrogates for the scientific community, that we are representing the information appropriately to the patient so that we can keep them engaged and, and, and earn their trust and continue to keep their trust. Thank you. I'm going to ask one follow-up question and then Michelle Andrews will start asking you all of all of you the questions that have been posed in the chat. So Dr. Johnson, what just kind of share with us and you didn't know I was going to ask you this question, so hold on to your socks. Mm -hmm. But how do you what do you say to folks who have been wanting to participate in clinical trials, don't know how to get involved. And also, would you encourage uh, communities of color to participate in, and I think you already pretty much answered that, but to participate in clinical trials? That's, that's a lot. <laughs> But uh, I'd like to lean in first with my, with my advocacy for research in general. Um, um, as probably was mentioned in my brief bio, I trained in a space um, a, a, in an academic institution that really believed in patient clinical care, education, and research. I bought into that early as a clinician. I've always been an advocate for research. When the biopharma representatives came to our offices to offer their medications, I was the one who wanted to know, um, are people who look like me, well, that diabetic medication, well, that hypertension medication, I think what we fail to understand, even though COVID has brought tons of science to the table. And even though we've all become virologists in 10 months, um, what, 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 it is not that simple. And it is important that we do have the facts. It is important that we continue to, to get true facts to treat patients. Um, so I encourage clinicians, first of all, because what we know in the research community is if your primary care home suggest a study or suggest participation in a study, uh, doctors like me are more likely to get, and Dr. Rath are more likely to have those patients enroll in our trials. If we are selecting the trials that are sound and vetted appropriately to match the kinds of in, uh, interests in our communities that we advocate for, I think that we will push this conversation along much further for therapeutics and for um, uh, even for, for evalu evaluatory tools in medicine. Um, not only are these vaccines emergency use authorized? But I think that what's often missed in this conversation is that even our test 
testing, uh, our rapid testing, our PCR tests, those are emergency use authorized. And so we, we, we have a lot of faith in science. We have a lot of faith in something and things that um, are not fully vetted by the FDA in the traditional way. So when we put our stamp on that, we must understand and believe what we're, otherwise we're gonna lose our patients and we're gonna lose the trust of our patients. So um, I hope that answered the question. Um, you did. Thank you. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Andrews. And if any of you have any questions, please direct your questions now to Michelle, and she will address those, uh, get your questions answered by our panelists. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Ms. Turner. And thank you to all of our experts for being here tonight for this. I mean, this conversation was extremely enlightening. So thank you all for giving your side. Um, I do want to just make a disclaimer. The first question I received regarding healthcare workers with symptomatic um, exposure, I got logged out. So I missed that question. So if, if, if you're still here, if you could resend that question to me, that would be great. Um, and this is to whomever wants to answer it on the panel. Um, the first one was, how can the public and or health officials try to do their due diligence in slowing the spread of misinformation surrounding the COVID vaccine? Because specifically one audience member had a friend um, from the Ukraine who got some wildly, you know, false information that was seemingly true. So how can we try to slow the spread of that kind of misinformation? I think first, one of the things is to get, get it from the source. Um, we are talking, for example, about the Moderna vaccine, but tomorrow, um, probably others of you as well, will do like I did last Thursday and listen to the entire evaluation, um, the entire meeting as it's presented in real time. Um, kudos for the transparency that uh, the bodies have created so that I can, I can have the opportunity to do that. But I think it's important that we get the information and, and also filter that information appropriately um, for our patients and, and, and first for ourselves. Yeah, what, I tell, what I tell people is when you buy a car, you go on the internet, you look at many sources, but if you really want you go to Carfax or you go to Kelly Blue Book Value, when you go and look at uh, this, you look at the CDC, look at the NIH, look at your professional society, whether it's American, uh, College of Physicians or American Academy of Family Physicians. American, I mean, look at those sites. <clears throat> they are also not profit. Immunized Action Coalition is one of them. There are many other places that you can get the FDA website, CDC website. I think it's, it's, it's important. We spend a lot more time trying to figure out which airline we are going to take for the cheapest fare uh, for our vacation than we do on our healthcare. So I think, and, and look at trusted sources. I think, uh, you know, as Abraham Lincoln said, everything on, uh, uh, internet is not true. Does anybody else want to hit on that point? I love that analogy with the with the car buying and the vacation. That's that's really true. Um, does anybody else want to hit on that? No. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, I know we talked about the 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 rate of the each separate vaccine and its efficiency rate. But uh, an audience member wanted to know what is the likelihood of you contracting COVID following the, the, the correct precautions of the vaccination? And if you do contract COVID after following, you know, directed orders from the vaccination, how is that possible? Well, first, we had to understand that the, the trials showed, and that's the point I tried to make and very quickly, that it prevents disease. It does not prevent infection. What that means is if you get the infection and you're asymptomatic, they didn't look for those people. But if you got disease, then they looked at that. What they found was that people were less likely to be less likely to be severely ill, less likely to be hospitalized, less likely to be in the ICU, less likely to be to die from that. So I think that's the important point. So yes, you can still get infected, but that happens. For, you know, we, we gave, those of us who take the influenza vaccine, that happens all the time. You get the influenza vaccine and you can get the influenza, but you will not be that sick. CDC has data that you're going to be less likely to uh, get hospitalized if you take the vaccine, even if there's a mismatch in what's in the vaccine and what's circulating. So the point here is that you can still get the infection. That's why you have to do uh, the, uh, that's why you have to take all the precautions. Now, 
the Moderna vaccine, they now have some data that they may also prevent against infection because what they did was they followed these people for seven days uh, for the Pfizer vaccine, 14 days, no, after seven days for the Pfizer, after 14 days for uh, 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 Moderna vaccine to see if they got sick or they self-reported that they are sick. They were e-diaries and all of that. <coughs> so if they had an inf if anybody had infection and did not report, then they were not tested. So you don't know that, but we will, we will know that in due, in due course. Michelle? Yes. Yeah, that's it, Michelle. Okay, I just didn't know if anyone else wanted to hit on that one. Oh, well, okay. All the other questions from the audience have been answered in depth regarding pregnancy and um, teenagers and, and so on and so forth. And I have not gotten any more since my introduction. So thank you guys for your answers to the questions and your conversation. I'm gonna pass it to Mr. Stone and let him kind of take the reins on this. All right, I um, just wanna thank everyone for this incredible presentation. Um, you know, I, I told this joke couple of days ago to the planning group um, when I was at the University of Connecticut and was responsible, was a faculty member responsible for the library and we we're trying to get a new library built, a new law library. I was complaining to the Dean um, about the fact that the medical school was getting all the money for their brand new building and we weren't getting anything. And, and the Dean said, Dennis, you gotta understand in the mind of the public, and, and mind you, this is just a regional joke. It wouldn't apply down here. In the minds of the public, uh, the, uh, the physicians talk to God and the lawyers talk to the devil. And nobody wants to share money with the lawyers. Um, this, this presentation has convinced me that doctors do really talk to God and they have gotten answers and they are out there fighting for us every day um, and trying to really uh, help us get through this, this pandemic and we're so grateful for that. And secondly, I wanna just express appreciation to all of the uh, Urban League staff and uh, our interns who made this possible, who are working behind the scenes to make this um, a smooth uh, presentation. And lastly, before I have uh, Dr. Rogers Kane and, and uh, Dr. Danford uh, finish off, I do wanna recognize one guest who's very important to me, who's been around a long time. And that's my mother who is 101 years old in, uh, in the next, uh, in two weeks. So I just wanna recognize her and thank her for attending this evening. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Rogers Kane uh, for some closing remarks. And then Richard, if you're still on, you could finish this off. Dr. Uh, Dr. Kane. Well, kudos to your mother. Um, as I tell many of my patients when they start complaining about what their, their mother or their father are doing and that it's not good for their health, I, I'll say this to you. Uh, your mother can tell me how to get to be 100 years, 101 years old. You can't. So I think I listen to her before I listen to you about, about any aging process. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending the meeting. I think that this is just the beginning of a dialogue that we all need to continue with the community. Uh, they are, someone brought up the fact that we want to, um, uh, where do they get information from? I think it starts with the scientists that we uh, have uh, 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 that attended this evening. You all are scientists, you went to school to train for uh, situations like this. And, uh, you know, it's a whole lot of smart guys out there, a lot smarter than me. And, uh, and so I rely on you guys to help us get this message out to the community because it is our responsibility, um, not just our um, desire to do so, but it's our responsibility that we help protect the community and we uh, look at eliminating health inequities as it exists in communities of color. With that, I get off my uh, 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 preaching course and then I'll turn it over to Jocelyn for the goodbyes. So Dr. Actually, Danford? Actually, Dr. Danford. Dan oh, Rich is still here? I didn't know he was still here. I'm on, uh, good evening again. I 
want to uh, thank all of you for joining us this evening. Uh, very, very successful program. Um, I tell you what, uh, uh, we're so thankful to have all of our partners uh, working along with the Jacksonville Urban League. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very heartening to know that uh, we're all advocates for the community. I think the community is first. I think that we need to do a better job of involving the community in all aspects of uh, the life of, of Jacksonville. And so uh, what we're doing, uh, certainly through, through our Center for Advocacy and Social Justice, <clears throat> you know, along with some of our other activities, we're looking at community engagement, community involvement, because I think if we ask the community uh, they will tell us how to make their lives better, and that's what we're committed to do. So thank all of you for joining in this evening. Thank you, everyone, and have a happy holidays, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. We're so, we're so appreciative. Thank you. And thank you, particularly, Jocelyn, for your moderation. Um, incredibly great uh, job with that. So thank you very much. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. Stay well. Same to me. Same to you guys. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.